Okay. okay, good evening and welcome. This is the January 23rd, 2023 meeting of the school committee. Call the meeting to order at six o'clock. The meeting is being both audio and videotaped this evening. And I would ask that everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, and that's it for all. Okay, move along. We'll start with a roll call. Sam, you want to start? Yes. Samantha Blasco as secretary. Pamela Blair, assistant superintendent for business. Gordon Smith, superintendent of schools. Gregory Thompson. Antonella Rochella. Elizabeth Marcin Boucher. Amy Talenta. Boucher, student representative. And Sarah Trulio. And thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Vote tonight. Um, meeting minutes for approval and motion, please. Okay. Um, I move to approve the meeting minutes for December 5th, 2020, regular session. Motion made by Beth. Second. Second by Amy. <laughs> Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion and I'll carried. abstain. Thank you, Sarah. Motion carries 401. Okay. Next up, we have committee and subcommittee communications. Wait, didn't you say December 5th? December 5th. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, January 9th. Jan oh, my God. Let's I do that do again. I'm yeah. sorry. Okay. I, I'm looking at the I read it right off of it, and I should have yeah, it. All right. All right, scratch that last one. Do it again. I'm going to read it off of my. It's only because I'm trying to get to the basketball game, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. time here. I move to approve the January 9th, 2023 regular session meeting minutes. Sorry about that. Correct motion made by Beth. <laughs> Second by Amy. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. And I'll and abstain again. <laughs> I was reading them before Four. I asked. I didn't even catch it. Thank you. And I'm looking at it and I was. <laughs> okay. Moving on, committee and subcommittee community communication. You want to start, Antonella? Sure. Um, e Leaf will be February 11th. So buy your tickets. Okay. Mm -hmm. February 11th. Yep. Yep. Should be fun. Yeah. How's that going? A lot of tickets selling. Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's really good for the schools. They give a lot back to our schools and our teachers. So you know what they did this last year? Thirty-five thousand. Thirty-five thousand. Wow. Right around there. Pretty good, yeah. So mm -hmm. it's a nice benefit for our kids. We have with ten or eleven winners. Yeah, there was a good number yeah. of winners, and they're spending those funds. It's like it, emails, like what's that account number? What do I do? So that's good. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, I'm all good. Thank you. Amy? Um, I've attended several collaborative. They have some um, exciting things happening. They have a couple of new hire, hires and different positions coming up. And one cool thing is that they are, they've um, obtained some funds for some electric school buses, which is really cool. I heard about that. Yeah. So I thought that I would share that. I think that's a really, a really neat initiative that they're. they're we see one in East Elemental, do you know? I think we will. Okay. Yeah. 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 Every district at least have one. Oh, wow. Yeah. And does it say electric on the side? So we'll know if it's different than the others. Yeah, sure, Gordon. What did they That's say? That's a good, uh, I don't know what they're going to do. I bet they do. Like, but they're... They said they're about 10 months out. Okay. Because they're coming in quicker, quicker. than yeah. regular wow. school buses right now. Oh. So they're, they seem pretty excited about that. Okay. Yeah. I think they got a, not to interrupt you, but they got a, Another grant for the charging stations. Right. <laughs> yeah, sure is. Stepped out at all three yards. Well, once. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Julia. Okay. So uh, to begin, last Wednesday, the high school term two slash like the semester ended. Um, and then there's also Read Across America Day on Friday, March 3rd. Um, and all juniors and seniors have the opportunity to read at different classes at Meadowbrook. And permission slips need to be turned in by February 28th. 
Um, and many sports have been doing well, you know, winning and everything. Uh, I know that the boys varsity basketball won their last two games against Granby and Westfield, and they have another game tomorrow at 7 p.m. at the high school. Um, the senior class is having a fundraiser called Support a Senior Night at the Thunderbirds game on January 28th, and the tickets are $24 each. Great. How do you get those tickets in? You know, uh, I think there's like anyone that has like a child at like the high school should get like, I don't know if they're like online or anywhere, but they did get like an email. So okay. That. Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. Opportunity for visitors. Seeing none, moving right along. Mr. McGee, seventh grade waiver for ELHS softball. Come on up, please. I'm up there. Okay. Oh, did Sarah have anything? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, That's okay. Seven. No, I, I haven't been around, so I'm I'm okay. Thank you, though. Okay. Nice to hear your voice, though, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, Nella. That's two saves. You, you should be, you be sitting here. Sir. So, um, thank you for uh, hearing this waiver. So, a little bit of background on softball. Two years ago, we did not have a JV team. Last year, the school committee approved an eighth grade waiver, and we had four eighth graders play on our JV team. Uh, this year, about two months ago, the school committee approved another eighth grade waiver for this year. So our head coach had an interest meeting for ninth through 12th graders and for eighth graders. And there's 19 ninth through 12th graders interested in playing, and there's only two eighth graders that are interested in playing. Um, so with just 21 softball potential players, the varsity coach and I uh, talked about that we would be in risk of not having a JV softball team. Um, because of that risk of not having a JV softball team, we talked about the potential of asking for the first ever seventh grade waiver. So the school committee has never approved a seventh grade waiver before. Um, but we talked to uh, both building principals at, at uh, the middle school and the high school. They both support that seventh grade waiver. Uh, our goal is to field a JV softball team. The MIA has some guidelines. And those guidelines are really meant to protect the 9 through 12 players so that they don't lose an opportunity to play. So that's really important to the MIA. That's important to me. That's important to Mr. Page and to the varsity coach. So those guidelines, um, if we ended up with a larger than expected number of high school softball players, so if a, if a bunch of 9 through 12th graders end up signing up wanting to play, then we are expected to cancel the seventh grade waiver. So if we go over 30 that are signed up, it, we are expected to cancel that seventh grade waiver, even if the school committee approves it. Seventh and eighth graders uh, are only allowed by the MIA to play on the JV team because it's important that those players are not displacing current ninth through 12th graders. If we use the waiver, the MIA rules would pro prohibit cutting any high school players ninth through 12. So again, the, the goal is to not displace ninth through 12th players. Um, and if we use the waiver, then it is the uh, high school principal and my expectation that all high school players nine through 11 that are on the JV team will still play more than half of the game as long as they are working hard, attending practices and have a good attitude. So again, all of those goals from the MIA, the expectations from the MIA are to make sure that nine through 12 don't get displaced by seventh graders. Um, but at the same time, we really need those seventh graders to be able to field a JV team this year. Uh, if the numbers stay the way they are. So many other schools in Western Mass are approving seventh grade waivers. Um, a lot of our current opponents play against sev seventh graders already. Those opponents are East Hampton, Northampton, Chicopee Comp, and West Springfield. All of those teams are on our schedule with seventh graders on the team. And other Western Mass schools that have seventh graders on their teams are schools like Athol, Bay State Academy, Amherst, and Hoosick Valley. Um, so that's that's how we got to this point. And I just, you know, I think it's real important to know that if we do have a surge of signups in nine through 12, then we would be expected to remove that seventh grade waiver if it is approved. And also the eighth grade waiver, if we got over 30. Yeah. So if, if we were over 30 and just nine through 12, then we'd also be expected to remove the eighth grade waiver. So all of all of the waiver process has been approved by uh, Western Mass Athletic Directors. It's been approved by the MIA. Um, the last step is the school committee, and all of that approval is all based on need. So if if the, if the need gets taken away because there's a surge in signups, then we then we remove the request. Okay. Questions. 
sense of how many centers might be interested? I'm hearing approximately five to seven. So our varsity coach, uh, Coach Webb, is phenomenal. She's going into her second year. She has been instrumental with communicating with youth softball and, and having those meetings. Um, and she's told me a number of approximately five to seven seventh grade. Great. Appreciate the info you gave us. It's so, very helpful. Or, you know. Yep. So the other document in your packet is that it's kind of a some guidelines to our waivers. And we'll make sure that all seventh and eighth grade parents and potential student athletes receive that document because there's some MIA policies that middle school parents and athletes may not be aware of. So when you say the athletic directors, it goes out to all the directors to approve yeah. our Correct. Okay. At the monthly athletic director meetings, they want to hear the numbers, they want to hear the returning players, uh, and they will not approve any waivers that are over those minimum numbers. So on that second page in the packet of sport like softball, it says that the MIA recommended number is 15. Um, so for to have a sub varsity team, you would double that number so that the number is 30. And if we were to go over 30, then we would be expected to remove the waiver for the sub varsity. Uh, so there's numbers that are relevant to each sport. So if there was a concern of, well, we, if we open up the seventh grade waiver to, the, to softball, what's going to stop us from having seventh grade waivers in soccer? And the answer is the numbers. Yeah. It would never even get to this point because the athletic directors in Western Mass would not approve it if we were over those minimum numbers. And what about for sports that are more contact oriented, football, wrestling, even basketball, have Waivers been uh, approved for those? I'm talking basically size is my question. Size yeah. of so athletes. Um, they have been approved in different schools, but it's definitely taken into consideration um, the safety of the athlete. Yeah. That's an, more of an individual school decision on on player safety. Um, and a, for East Long Meadow sports like soccer, basketball, we've always been able to field varsity and sub varsity teams uh, waivers never apply to a freshman level team so we would never request a waiver for a for a third for a second sub varsity team that would not be approved yep. okay how does this impact like our our town teams yep so there's no um, requirement that they can't play on both teams so they can they can still sign up for both teams they can still be a member of both teams the only requirement is the high school team has to be the priority. So there, there would be some um, scheduling concerns for the rec team that has softball. So they may have to be creative with their scheduling. Um, the, the MIA expectation is if a seventh or eighth grader is on the high school team, that high school team has to be the priority. They can't miss practices or games for any other sport um, at any other level. So the impact is they can play both. They just can't miss high school games for the other sport. Um, practice times wouldn't conflict. It would be the game days that would be the, the issues. <laughs> the high school games tend to start at 4.30. Um, and the um, rec level games may be later starts. So there would be some uh, adjusting with their scheduling. Um, but we we would have to schedule the high school sports with the expectation that high school is the priority. Because a concern would be that they would be on the high school team and then maybe the rec teams, they wouldn't have enough kids to for that, the other kids to have, play on a team. Oh. Um, so that it's one of my concerns. Also, how are we trying to recruit high school kids to try and play? Are we doing anything or how do they get information about trying to try out for the softball team or? Sure. So I'm going to send out a plus portals communication next week, opening up signups for spring. And I will uh, put an emphasis on softball that we're short on numbers and we're looking for more softball players. Our head varsity coach was also our JV girls volleyball coach. So she's been recruiting since the fall and encouraging anybody that's interested in trying softball. Um, so she's been actively recruiting high school players. Uh, I will communicate that through plus portals next week when we open registrations. And that's really the goal is to, to fill the roster with nine through 12 players. Hmm. Um, but 
again, if we if we don't have enough, then we might be in the situation like two years ago where we were not able to field the JV team. And then there's five or six players that are either practice players or end up getting cut um, or don't really get any playing time. So um, that's and I'm also here um, because our varsity coach um, is, you know, she's very dynamic. I've gotten great feedback from the community on her, and she is just looking forward to working with East La Middle softball players. She can't do that um, currently with seventh and eighth graders unless we have the waiver. So it's also a, an excellent opportunity for her to, within the rules of the MIA, work with seventh and eighth graders, which she wouldn't be able to do that um, if they weren't part of the program. And I think to your point, Antonella, it's it's tricky too because you want to ensure that we have a rec a rec team that's able to continue to flourish. But at the same time, if there's nothing to aspire to outside of rec within the high school program, mm -hmm. then you you kind of lose interest in a sport. So if you're somebody who's in eighth grade thinking maybe I'll make a JV team, but then no JV team exists, you might drop um, a sport if there's not opportunities at the high school level based on where you're coming in as a student athlete. So hopefully they can find that balance. That was going to be my exact question was how do you ensure that if the waiver isn't needed, that the kids still can enroll um, in the rec. So that's great to know that they'll be able to do both. Yeah, I would encourage them to do both. And I would encourage the rec teams to schedule as many weekend games as possible. So currently there's no high school games scheduled on weekends. Mm -hmm. So uh, any of those rec games that are scheduled on weekends, they would be able to attend. Their practices are typically after high school practices anyway. Um, so there shouldn't be a conflict with those practices. It would definitely take some extra um, flexibility and effort by the rec department with scheduling of their games. And, and I think a lot of their games would be on weekends because the field space availability is also an issue uh, in town um, with when they could play week weekday games. So they could really stack their schedule to play lots of Saturday and Sunday games, uh, which would not conflict with high school sports. Do you think some of the problems with getting kids is that I know for softball, they have to go to Birchland, right? Is that where they do their practice or do they ever practice here on these fields? Uh, they can practice here. So they we have two indoor batting cages where they occasionally have practice indoors. Um, they do have the potential to practice here. Uh, it is one of the goals of mine, and I, I know a lot of people in town um, to have softball fields on site in the in the future. Um, I don't think we're losing players because they're practicing at Birchland currently. Okay. <laughs> I don't. I don't think that's. We also um, they have the opportunity to take uh, the high school buses to Birchland. So some of the players who don't have transportation, LPVC allows them to get on the buses and be transported to Birchland right after school. Okay, thank you. And does it go, I, I, you might have already answered this, but if we need more players, does it automatically go to seventh and eighth or does it go to eighth first and then seventh? Correct, it would be eighth grade first. Okay. And the only way that uh, the MIA would allow a seventh grade waiver and, and, and um, would approve that is if we're still under the number. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, anything else? Uh, I would entertain a motion. I move to accept the seventh grade MIA waiver for softball as softball as described by Mr. McGee today. Okay, motion made by Beth. Second. Second by Antonella. Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries five to zero. Mr. Thank McGee, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank Good night. You. A lot of the happy softball players. So thank you. Cool. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Moving right along, we have discussion on the 2024 budget development. Yes. So in your packet is a document. Um, so as you as you know, we have different funding sources for the school department um, budget. And the first is the operating budget, which comprises of the chapter 70 money that we get from the state and then the local contribution. Um, 
I thought it was important to uh, remind everyone that typically the chapter 70 numbers come from the state in the third week of January, but because we have new administration, they get an additional five weeks to prepare the budget. So I'm not expecting that until the beginning of March, um, which is, you know, it happens every how often four years when this. Um, so um, I wanted to list out the chapter 70 history here so that you folks could be reminded how it has gradually um, increased, which, which is great. Um, because and I think that's mostly because of the Student Opportunity Act of I think it was 2019, um, where there was uh, inequities and and they're trying to um, to change that and, and better things. So that's that's a really good thing. I do want to bring to your attention that in uh, 21 and 22, you're going to see a drop there. And I believe that is all due to the pandemic and the drastic <laughs> reduction in enrollment that everybody across the state, um, you know, across the world, I guess here experienced. And it definitely had an impact on our chapter 70 at those those years. Um, so that was the first thing I wanted to share with you and then uh, come down to, to tell you that although I don't have the projected level services budget completed yet, I do have my wonderful budget book here that I'm, um, you know, peeling off the different layers of the budget because as you can imagine, there's a lot to go through and I never want to give any kind of numbers until I'm very confident when I work with um, Mr. Smith here and we feel um, very confident to then bring it to the school committee. So I just wanted you to know I am working on that. Um, what we do know is that currently there are some areas of focus um, for budget development and that would be right now, I'm sure there's there will be others that um, fruition, but right now, Meadowbrook Preschool, we need to uh, continue to ensure appropriate staffing levels there. So we are analyzing that and uh, we'll bring additional information as it becomes apparent to us. Um, the special education out of district tuitions, there is a 14% increase um, that is projected to be approved by the Mass Operational Services Division. On average, out of, out of district special ed tuitions go up more like a 2% every year, you know, give or take a little bit, which is normal. 14% is significant. Um, so as you can imagine, it's a hot topic across all districts. Um, I, I believe um, MASBO, which I belong to, um, as well as Gordon with the superintendents, put out a, a nice letter trying to make sure all business managers and superintendents knew about this could come and share it with their school committees and certainly have it as a topic of discussion during budget. And they stated that um, that 14% comes from, it's 5.18% is cost of living increase and 8.82% is what they're calling a workforce stabilization factor. So you're getting 14% more. No, they're going to, yes. we have to pay 14% for out of oh, tuition. Okay, just want to understand. Yes, I'm thought it was you. heart palpitation, so I will continue. Yes, it, 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 is, a, it, it is going to be um, a significant so number. To, which we're sending some students right. to be getting 14% more, okay. where I think on average, it's been like going up about 7%, 3%. Here, but this for FY24, it's 14%. So when I have more of the detail on those numbers, I'll bring them to you. And that's How many students that. are there? Uh, on, on circuit breakers, which I have as, as another page for you to look at here, there are 30, uh, oh, kind of, well, there are 38. For the out of district oh. tuition, right? Is what they're yeah. asking about out of district tuition. Yeah. District, right? Yeah, I was going to say 38, but um, I think it's. Because you have some students that are in district that circuit breaker. Some out of district don't qualify for circuit breaker. No, yes. almost all out of district. Yeah, qualify. I would think. Yeah. Yes, because yeah. out of all that would, there are some majority of them. Right, and there are some in district who qualify for circuit breaker as well. That number that is, is the threshold is approximately forty-seven thousand, I think. Um, so it's those expenses that go above that threshold that then can be applied towards uh, circuit breaker. Right. Do we have any students that are coming from other school districts into special education programs that we offer? Not this year. We did have um, a student from another district uh, for the prior three years. And yeah, three or four. Our ASD program. Okay. Currently, no, we do not. And I'm sorry, I don't know the exact number of the out of district. I know that the number on the circuit breaker um, is 38. 38. So that's what's stuck in my head. Yeah, yeah I, I would think. <laughs> 
Um, so I just wanted to, oh, I'm sorry, didn't want to forget that we also have the paraprofessional negotiations taking place. Uh, we've had, I think, many conversations that that is an area that we really have to look at. Um, minimum wage going up, the expectations, um, you know, that uh, that their job responsibilities. Um, so I just want to throw that out there again. I don't have a number. Um, but during the budget process, we work together to come up with a uh, uh, a good number during the budget to, to put in there to project out um, for the negotiations. I think our next our meeting is February next 7th. February 7th. Thank you. So we'll keep you updated on that. And the last thing is just, you know, the continued impact the pandemic has had on students and staff. And what does that actually mean? Because it hasn't ended as, as we all know, it still continues. So those will be conversations that um, we continue to have during the budget process. I wanted to remind you that your current ELPS uh, 2023 budget for the school department is 33319015 It is approximately half of the town's um, budget, and that's typical for, for every district across Massachusetts. Um, and to just tell you that for every half a percent increase to the current to that current budget, that equates to an approximate increase of $167,000. Oh, we just flip the page. Sure. I just wanted to pick up on one point. Um, that final bullet point continued impact of the pandemic on students and staff and that's going to be a significant one not just this budget year but i think budget years going forward because um as we know we've had federal funding come in as all districts have for the last few years to help with that impact we're certainly utilizing that uh, around professional development um around curriculum around um personnel in some cases, so predominantly actually right now, more personnel with the first two years being more professional development and um, curriculum. We also, as you know, when Ms. Brown has presented, um, have used the DESE grants available to help identify high quality curricular materials and start that implementation and help with um, professional development. The challenge will be when these grants are no longer available and that will be coming soon. Um, I don't know what DESE may do in terms of their grants, but I would imagine their grants available for curriculum and professional development will get smaller. Um, but the ESSER grants will run out uh, September of 2024. And so we're managing those as we go through and Mrs. Blair um, does an incredible job doing that and keeping us all on task, especially me, <laughs> as I say, oh, sorry. Uh, but uh, you know, those are things we're very aware of and will be pivotal in figuring out where um, level services will be for next year, because we have this year, a number of things that are in ESSER and we may have to start to slide over to operational, the operational side, but we also are very aware, what does that do to level services for next year? And we did a little bit of that last year. We're trying to do a little bit more this year, but um, just to keep in mind, that that's something that is ongoing. Um, and you know, as we continue into this school year in the spring and into next school year, we learn more about what the pandemic has done socially and emotionally, um, not just students, staff as well. Uh, that's probably something that um, is a little bit more hidden, uh, but I think that's gonna start to come out and it's definitely in our discussions in ELPS. Uh, actually, we're gonna put out a, a staff survey. We usually do it at the end of the year, but talking with both the leadership team and the ELEA officers, idea we're going to do another student survey anyway maybe put out a staff survey at the same time i just need to um speak it a little bit uh, the end of the year survey is not necessarily the same as we talk about in terms of the wellness survey that we do with students so I want to do that same for staff it's, it's all about one community so we need to continue to think about how we support all who are within it sorry mr blair no i'm glad I get off it no, nope, very well spoken and <laughs> thank you for chiming in. Um, on page two, circuit breaker reimbursement. This is another funding source for the school department. As we just um, were talking about, special ed um, 
expenses that go over and above, I, is it four times at a, at, per pupil? So it ends up about that $47,000 amount. And um, we have a new um, student services director, Michael Fredette, who's doing a great job and communicating with Gordon and I all the time, because as we know, special ed changes all the time, um, students coming in, students leaving. Um, it was the same with, you know, our, I always say when I, when I give your quarterly report that it's a snapshot, you know, of where we are right now, but it does things, things change all the time. So um, this, this was a significant funding source, because as you can see, um, if you look at this, I've given you the history for the last 10 years, and uh, this current year, we've, we are receiving $1.2 million. Um, if I just bring down those same scenarios for, you know, projecting for FY24. So again, that's just what I did. The same number of students, the 38, and, and how we projected over. Again, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic that we will get 75% reimbursement, and I believe we will be at the $1.2 million again. Um, Even with the 14%? Increase in out of district food. This is simply what we'd received through circuit breaking. This is right, but L, so the the net claim. Yep. This should be higher this year if we have the same students. The eligible. That fourteen percent is going to be next year, so they're always like a year behind. You have to. So it'd be Just FY twenty five this year. We get back next year. Right, so that's even worse. Correct. For our next year. We're going to realize the 14% next year, but we're not going to get the yeah, we'll have circuit, breaker circuit breaker for the following yeah. year. Correct. So out of our operating budget, we'll have to realize that 14%. Correct. Yes. Out of the yeah, three points, ways, well, yeah. the, 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 the less the foundation, now the 1.8. I'm 1.8, we're going to add 14% to that. The, the, the found, less foundation. There is he, Adam. So, no, no. The back of the so I think you're... So if these 38 are all out of, out of district, right? Just make that assumption. Oh, okay. You're talking about less foundation. And that, so the less foundation, that's our portion that we're going to have to pay. That's ours. The net claim is what we claim. Well, then that's after the four, four times. But anyway, the, our less foundation, that's our number, but that's going to go up 14%. Our expenses are, yes. Right. So this number this year will be 14% higher, the less foundation. They all, right. but the one we realized, the 1.8, will be up 14. percent So that's 100 and uh, so 200,000. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You just made it droopy. I know, right? It's I'm so sorry. No, that's. No, well, I mean, right. Right. Yeah, no, that, yeah. you're right. It's about two. If it's the same, if it's 38 and 38, then we'll actually up 14. percent And I don't know if it's exactly the same. This is kind of right. Like, We're making an assumption. Yes. Right. Making assumptions here. And we don't know the reimbursement rate either. We don't. No. How well, you see historically that it's it's been 70 to 75. 75 yeah, 70, 75 most often, 74 next. And, and I did get still had money too, right? So it, it, yes, right I to 75. just read an article from uh, Governor Healy who said that she, uh, Circuit Breaker was one of the items that, that she definitely said she supports and um, transportation expenses. She is totally getting the expenses that education um, have right now. So again, I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, yeah. Where we'll go with this? The other part, uh, Mr. Thompson, you just mentioned the state has money. So there, there is, the commissioner did speak about, um, he didn't say it was a rainy day fund, but there are funds that might be able to be applied to help mitigate that 14%. And so that is something that superintendents are discussing with the commissioner. That was uh, the main topic of his last Zoom call with superintendents. Um, and then, chapter 70 increase? It wouldn't be a chapter 70 increase. I think it would be through some other means, Separate. right? Um, but my understanding is DESE and the associations are lobbying the legislature because that's probably where it's going to have to be coming from, right? Um, for that to happen. But the point you're making is accurate. There yeah. are funds available. Yeah. It's just a question of whether the legislature follows through and actually funds makes them available the to help. <laughs> Mitigate that fourteen percent. It cost. won't be the whole fourteen. I bet we'll take any any Anything. mitigation they can provide us. Yes, we will. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So those are things that um, are being discussed and will continue to be discussed. And actually, um, the at least the Connecticut Valley Roundtable, as they do every year, will be hosting a luncheon for state reps and senators. Um, and so we'll be. That's going to be a main topic item. Otherwise, they don't get lunch. 
<laughs> Pinko commit first exactly. before lunch. There you go. Where they sit down. They get a late lunch. Late lunch. <laughs> Peanut butter and jelly. But that's a that's a good point. There is state has done really well in terms of tax collection and uh revenues well, that have come out. Yeah. True. Yeah. But their tax collections have been up the last yeah, yeah. receipts. Yeah. Yeah. So uh anyway. Okay. So there is money available. So we are going to push on that. Uh, the other, sorry, I just oh, yeah. it off, but then took it right back. <laughs> um, the other piece to this um, that at least is uh, nice and collaborative and connected is that Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative, of which we're a part, they offer special education services. They offer transportation services and other services, which the seven districts all um, take part in. They're not going up 14%. They're going up more uh, within their regular costs, which are roughly two to 3%. So that's good. That's also something we need to look at and see, okay, can we expand services there? Yeah. Um, and maybe have alternatives to some of these other uh, out of district placements. I mean, obviously they can't expand and open up so many spots that all seven districts can start you know, flooding. Right. But uh, certainly that's something that we're discussing. I know that they were discussing purchasing buildings for like one program. I'm just not sure if that program's up and running yet. That would be for more intensive they, needs. They did just um, expand. They didn't purchase, uh, to my knowledge, a building. They uh, oh, they did purchase something, but I thought they did. I think they sold something in it. Yeah, go forth. But um, they um, have consolidated and done quite, uh, I think, nice work in their Wayne program, uh, and so now they have. Early childhood, or uh, excuse me, elementary, um, middle, and high school, all under their Brush Hill campus. Okay. So that's something that uh, has been going well and, and has expanded. Uh, and there are spots, at least on the elementary level, I think, that are open because that's relatively new. So something that we need to uh, yeah. continue to look at. They spread those spots out evenly amongst the districts, or is it first come? Um, it's basically first come first, really? first serve. Yeah, you, so you apply. Like and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll put a cone in that spot. Save the spot. <laughs> kind of like a parking spot. Save it a seat. Yeah, there you go. Okay. And so then on page three is your final um, funding source here, which is your grants and revolving accounts. Um, I just thought it was important. I just took a snapshot from that first quarter financial that I had done for you to just remind folks, um, you know how how much we get from this area. And truly, um, if we were to add this onto the operational budget, it's closer to 37 million that it takes to run a school. I mean, yes, we do roll over some of these, these balances from year to year, but um, that's a more accurate picture. So again, that's where we're at right now. Um, I'm still diligently working on your budget for you with Mr. Smith and we'll um, hopefully at the next meeting have much more for you. So for next year, I know we had talked about the technology insurance student taking a look at that after a couple of years. We're probably what five, four or five years into that. Yep. Mm -hmm. So the balance is healthy and it is. our receipts are more than double the expenses this year. I know every mm -hmm. year is different. So I know once maybe once we get through budget season, we can uh, analyze Bring Ryan in and uh, yeah. see about looking at that number. I hear that those uh, Chromebooks are getting old. Are getting slow. Yeah, very slow. Yeah. Especially the Chromebooks, seat. though, um, are uh, in for capital renewal yeah, I know. every year. Are they? Yeah. Okay. Oh, every year. All right. 7,000. 127,000. Yes. And they're still doing it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Um, they were approved last year and it's in the capital budget for IT this year. Whatever they can fix without buying new ones, though. You right. Know? Unfortunately, for seniors, obviously you're. I'm on death. <laughs> so they would be the ones that are <laughs> renewal. A lot of typing going on in that, and I think the seniors will all get through to the end. I'm sure <laughs> they'll make it. So, do we approve or? This is more informational. Um, one other item is we're. Uh, Mrs. Blair and I are meeting with we've we've discussed budget the budget process over two leadership team meetings and now having individual building meetings so that they can discuss uh, individual needs and we'll bring those you as we put together our final 
budget request. Is this the quarterly uh, statement? No, that's uh, that's what, well that that's from the uh, first quarter. Nine thirty twenty two. We already approved that. Yes, yes. Th this was just informational. I did not do your second quarter yet. I was working on the budget. We felt that was more important. Yep. But hope, hopefully, the next meeting I'll have your second quarter. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Welcome. All right. Let's dive back into the school calendar discussion. Okay. So last um, meeting, we uh, had discussed uh, a proposed 23-24 school year calendar. And um, the half days were predominantly the same. The um, largest area of discussion was around, do we want to do anything next year, given that the day before the holiday break in December is the 22nd, where traditionally uh, most years it's the 23rd, and you have that as a full day. Um, discussed that uh, quite a bit, and what was asked was, can we get some um, attendance information, which is also in your packet, regarding um, attendance on the half day before the Thanksgiving recess and then the half day before the December um, or holiday recess. So in your packets, I've given you by building uh, this year's attendance, both their daily attendance for students and staff, and then um, the attendance on those half days. And as you can see, as you go through, middle column is the uh, this year's half day in November before the Thanksgiving recess. Um, for the most part, uh, you see that uh, students, actually for the, all of them, student attendance has gone down in all the schools. Um, although if you look at the elementary level, as you look across, it does go down, but it's relatively the same, whether it be the half day in November or the half day in December. It doesn't change all that dramatically. Um, as you get to the middle and the high school, uh, that half day in December, their attendance drops somewhat considerably, definitely at the middle school, at the high school, not as much given that um, you are already down close to 30 percentage points. Um, and then you drop another six or so. Uh, yep. Interestingly enough, at least in a couple of the buildings, staff attendance went up. It's interesting. I really can't take those days off. <laughs> Just saying, it was, it's kind of an interesting eye opener. For me. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, yeah. It's interesting. And part of me is like, it's good information to have. Um, part of it is in my mind, like, and say, for instance, you decide to take those, make those full days off, which then I feel like it just really starts bringing it out. Yeah. And there was a lot happening, a lot happening in terms of kids being sick, at least where I worked, I'm assuming it was similar. But like, if you did change it to full days, I would, I would ask that you look at this information again in a couple of years and see, is it just because it's the days that they are? I mean, it's not like, you know, what were they in 2018? What were they in 2017? You know, now we're looking at this picture of the la of just one year. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, was it, has it always been that low? You know? Yeah. And, I mean, I would say, yes, attendance is, you know, is going to dip on both. And is it going to... Uh, I would also... Are they going to take the day before off? Right. I, just that's... I think you're... If you shift it and you were to say, give a full day off, and you went, let's say you did a full day off, like this year... And Wilbraham gave the full day off on the 23rd. Right. My guess is their attendance dipped on the 22nd. Yeah. And there were kids that were gone the two days before they took a whole week off. Yeah. So, so that's, um, that's where you're I, talking about I actually have a week. Uh, yes. Thanksgiving break. I'm sorry. Now you were talking about, I was talking that about one's Monday. contractual though. Yes. yes. We can't. No, I, un I understand that, but I'm just saying in terms of, of Christmas, I think um, we had that day off the day before was a full day of a cacophony right, of right. fun, yes. And my guess is that your attendance was was different than your average daily attendance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, interestingly enough, I, I do have a student essay. I have to get back to the student. A uh, student wrote me a letter, a called it a persuasive essay, mm -hmm. around the holiday break, exactly. extending it. Wow. Uh, this individual had many good arguments 
um, from a domestic standpoint, but also has relatives who are abroad. And so, you know, you don't have the ability to go visit relatives abroad during that time where other nations, and uh, I don't have all these facts, so these are not uh, absolute, but if I remember correctly in reading it, um, quoted uh, or cited a few states where you have a longer holiday break. My guess is that there's also those states are, if I remember the states who are actually cited in the uh, persuasive letter, <laughs> they start much earlier. They start mid-August. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so then that may allow you to have, have those days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They also are uh, big football states. It's like the University of Massachusetts. I think they have six weeks for Christmas break. Right. Around until February, well, where the other schools are back. Oh, well, money would go back a week ago. They're back mid January. East Mass is first, second week in February. Wow. Yeah, it's really long. That one is really long. Yeah. So it's, you know, <laughs> people are doing, um, and institutions are doing many different things. So on this, you have the 22nd still as a half day, which puts the last day as the 12th. That, that's correct. Without snow days. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really the question for tonight is the 22nd of December. Mm -hmm. Sarah, what do you think on that? I think it's it's tricky. I mean, I think when I looked back at some of the documentation, I was not able to attend the last collaborative meeting. Um, it just fell too close to when I had surgery, so I wasn't able to get to that. Um, but the historical context was that when it was on the 22nd, forgive me if I'm inaccurate in this, Gordon, that it was a full day the last time that this happened. Yeah, it could be. You could be right on that. Absolutely. Yep. I think that's what the documents were that the collaborative provided us was that when it fell this far out, they did opt for a full day. Um, right. Oh. You know, I, just, I thought. I mean, I can try yeah, to no, check that. I think you're right historically, and and the collaborative members in this collaborative committee voted to recommend this calendar. Although, yes. Although Sarah and I abstained, or we had to abstain. Mm -hmm. um, we're ex officio. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think as we're trying to continue to move forward with a lot of the different work that we're doing, like I understand that half days provide an opportunity for um, some of the social emotional activities that some of the educators on the the collaborative um, mentioned that they provide those kind of um, <clears throat> options for educators, but I think. I think we have a, a large number of them already in our calendar so that we have those contact points and potentially having a full day. Um, be interesting to see what the attendance is. We don't really have data on full days prior to larger breaks because we don't really have right. a calendar that reflects a full day leading into a break. So, I, I mean, I think... I think if people are going to travel, they're going to travel regardless of whether or not we make it a half or a full day. Um, and it's an opportunity to have kids in classrooms. Um, we never know what to expect with winters. We never know what to expect with snow days. And if our calendar is built with the idea that we want as many contact hours with kids prior to, uh, you know, MCAS windows opening and prior to, you know, SATs and ACTs, then I would say we'd, we'd want a, a full day that day, um, but. What did the collaborative want? They, um, there was yes. strong discussion, you know, it was about 45 minutes, would you say, Sarah? On the calendar? The, the meeting, I wasn't at the last one, but the one before, right, it was, the... yes, it was a large conversation. I believe the actual vote was split that day. Um, yeah, four, two, four, two, you're right. Yeah, I, I there don't were think two teachers if, that uh, voted for a half day or full day. Full day. And with us, with Gordon and I participating, which we didn't necessarily have to, like it would have been four, a four. split four four right down the middle in terms of that group. Um, so I don't think I think it's one of those situations where, regardless of the the decision we make, it's there's going to be those that are see it as a positive and those that are not in favor of it. Um, but I think as we continue to move forward with the idea of half days, it might provide us an opportunity to gather more information um, relative to attendance, relative to 
Maybe there's with a full day, maybe there is more opportunity for whole school assemblies or things along those lines to continue to bring in the social emotional learning and the social emotional experiences rather than trying to recreate a half a full day in a half day like it's it's not practical especially with with lunch being rolled in now um it's not that's not good. feasible uh, um how do they do lunch they just paper bag it and send the classrooms just really quick i know that's off they no they have um well it's not a paper bag but they do have yeah containers and, and somewhat self-contained all right i guess i feel from my standpoint um like moving forward, I know that you're trying to eliminate as many of the half days. And if you are going to be eliminating half days, I would rather see them around, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas and then not eliminate half days and then take a full day off and then push out the end of the year further. Like I like it when the end of the year ends on the 12th or the 13th, you know, because I think in terms of, um, so I would rather see, as much as I, I hate to say, oh, do the half day right before Christmas. If you're trying to avoid the half days, I think you're better off avoiding them as the contract falls, like with Thanksgiving and Christmas, than to say, okay, we're going to make this half day here a full day off. And then instead of the kids getting off on the 12th, it's the 13th, and it keeps pushing it out. So that's yeah. my feelings. Moving so you wouldn't be in favor of not coming to school at 22nd. You would be in favor of a half day or a full day. Right. Okay. Yeah. Is there one you prefer? Yeah. I mean, I just think before the holidays have to, but if you're trying to eliminate and we're trying to make that a thing, then obviously if it's the 23rd moving forward, I think it's got to be half day. People got to get their stuff together. The 22nd is, you know. Because then, because next year, the 23rd is a Monday. Right. So then that we potentially would have off. That would be off. Talking about yeah. the 24th after that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Five school year. So if it, it makes it easier to have other days that our half days stay those half days yeah. so we're not bumping out the end of the year we'll I have would... less half days yeah or one less half day yeah that was a point that did come up um Gordon help me fill in the gaps if I'm not representing the conversation accurately but that was a conversation that came up at the collaborative group relative to going forward not to 23 24, 24 but 24 25 was the idea that would we want to open on the 23rd um so thinking even about that, like the next two years might look differently because we wouldn't even necessarily want to open for a half day on the 23rd, which makes good sense. But also thinking like, then maybe we should be making the consideration that when it's the 22nd to have a full day, knowing that the following year you would potentially be closed and not opening for a half day then. Right. And that Friday before, which would be the 20th, would be a full day. It'd be a full day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the last day before break then becomes a full day, potentially here and there. And there. Right. 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 With the idea that you're going to be off in that 20th. Right. Yeah. Right. I think we've overwhelmingly heard from families that half days are really, really difficult for the way people are living, right? You know, you know, yeah. all the different responsibilities that parents have. And so I, from my perspective, the way that the calendar falls this year, and obviously subsequent years will be a brand new discussion. I would I would support a full day on the twenty second of December. Okay. Yeah. And that did come up. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, Amy, that did come up too during the collaborative meeting, and I know both Gordon and I did um, share the concerns that we heard as a committee about families coming forward and talking specifically about. Um, the concerns around half days, not just in terms of the familial burden of child care, because we wanted to be, ensure that that wasn't the only message that educators were hearing, but also the academic concern of what kids are missing when they're not in school for a full day. So um, both of those did come forward and we made sure to, to share the concerns of families um, at the last collaborative meeting as well. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. I think to your point, Antonella, in the future, if it's a 23rd, I think we would consider that half day mm -hmm. because it's so much it's got to day closer. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Absolutely. Okay. But I take a motion then from someone. I'll try. <laughs> I make a motion to have December 22nd in the 2324 school calendar a full day. Oh, right. Am I doing it right? Yep. Okay. A full day 
Is that it? And the rest of the calendar as presented. Okay. And the rest of the calendar as presented. Okay. Motion made by Antonella. I'll second. Second by Beth. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. That carries five to zero. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, we have we have kind of already had a financial discussion that we kind of double dips on that, but more of a point of information: the town council has invited us to a our uh, mandatory uh, by charter meeting between the town council and the school committee for February seventh, six o'clock. They meet, I believe, six o'clock. Yeah. Yes. Right. So, if everybody wants to mark their calendar, I'm happy we're all invited again. They I asked for know. Valentine's Day. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I asked if we could get a different. Thank date. you. <laughs> so, so good to meet you. We'll, you want us to post for that meeting? And we'll post for that. Yep. Okay. So, post. And maybe we can clarify the time with them in case yep. they're, they may have us at a set time. So, to six, so. Is, oh, never mind. But we could just post for six and find out. Okay. And then we can let the committee know. What's up? No, I was looking at the ninth, which was building committee. Then I realized I went to yeah. the seventh, and I'm good. So. And at that meeting, you know, it's an opportunity for all of us to speak up. So if you have something, say your piece, because I probably will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, is that funny? Okay. <laughs> Anything else on that? I put that on there, but we pretty much covered most of the things. And a lot of it for that. So, um, you know, nice to get some uh, info from the council yeah. and see what they're thinking. So, okay, moving right along. Seven point one. We have a, a potential adjustment to the twenty twenty four capital plan. So, I apologize. Uh, this was not in your packet, but uh, at your places, uh, I give you some information on a project that um, just recently has become more urgent than some of our projects that have uh, that are on our capital plan or have been on our capital plan. Uh, you see on the top of the packet that I or that I gave you um, an email to me from Mr. Fenny, who is the superintendent for the Department of Public Works, and um, he is talking about uh, recommending and asking if um, we can move this project which is a, a roof repair project uh, for a section of roof at Birchland Park. It's uh, a section of roof that is over the kitchen area of Birchland Park Middle School. Um, and the way we've become aware of this situation um, is that over the last few years, we have had a leak that has been um, repaired and managed by the Department of Public Works. Um, but unfortunately it's been consistent mm -hmm. and um, and actually has dripped through um, the way the kitchen staff realizes it uh, is it's come through first ventilation and then eventually through the walk-in freezer, um, which that's a lot of layers to come through. Anyway, um, so this year as uh, we were dealing with it, as you know, we've had uh, somewhat of a wet fall and even a wet uh, winter uh, right now, just uh, rain, but uh, anyway, I digress. So um, they actually cut from the inside and have realized uh, that the water has done some significant damage. And so then the project itself is uh, somewhat well outlined by the second page, which is from Titan UK. Um, CPW will go out and get um, more price quotes, but this is uh, Titan Roofing is a company who has done work for the district uh, has been very reliable. And so this was the first group to which uh, to whom they reached out. And um, it gives you an idea of the breakdown of what the repair is. It gives you a quote for the work that um, Titan would be doing. And um, in discussion with DPW, um, they're recommending adding at least a 20% contingency. School projects, as you know, um, well, any capital project, even if it's approved this spring, wouldn't begin in before July 1. Um, so that would bring it a different way. Unless you fund it a different way, of course. Um, so that would bring this project to roughly $33,720. Uh, and to Mr. Thompson's point, um, 
it, it is a project that is over the threshold of $20,000, which then makes it in the eyes of the town a capital project. However, um, there is the possibility of funding something such as this differently. Um, Mrs. Blair was detailing some of the revolving accounts. One of the revolving accounts is um, each building has a facilities rental account. Um, Birchland Park uh, has a facilities rental account, which right now has about $59,000 in it. Um, so we did consult with uh, Dr. Allen, principal of Birchland Park Middle School, and he is comfortable funding uh, through that account uh, if the school committee uh, so chooses. Okay. <laughs> one, one option. Either way, <clears throat> DPW would like your um, approval to move this to the most urgent project of the projects that we prioritized. And the um, list of projects we prioritized and presented at least to both DPW and uh, Mary McNally, town manager, is the last page of the three pages that I gave you. So we did have the rest, or not, not the rest, but another section of Birchland Park Swoops, which is the ballasted section as number one, priority so the roof would be getting somewhat of a makeover so because first of all i'm happy it's getting done i'm happy they can use the funds they can use mm -hmm. um i'm hoping they can get the product they need to put in the roof mm -hmm. but if and i don't necessarily have a problem with moving it up but if the money is there and the ability to get it done is there what and this is going to be a separate project why is it we just can't push it through and have it done and not add it to our moving forward capital. Okay. But you you and, may be able to do that. I okay. just, yeah. I wouldn't even add it to the list. If so funded, didn't we have to No. Um, basically two things. One, it, given that it reached the threshold, I wanted to make sure you were all aware of it. But I think the threshold and is so that it two, goes up the bid, correct. not so that it goes yeah. on the list. You're, you're most likely you are. Yeah. yeah, you are correct on that. Um, and then two, this was something that um, obviously DPW can't just act on. And so they were bringing it, as you see in the um, in the email, they were asking first for my advice, but uh, my advice was to bring it here, given that it's, uh, it is at a, at a level of over the 20. Yeah. So okay. this list is specifically for funding from the town. town. Correct. If it doesn't need funding from the town, I don't believe it should go on the list. Yeah, why can't because we Because if it does, over? we all know that it will bump the last thing that would get funded off the list, right. even though the funding comes from the different source, right. I think we just fund it. Yeah. Can't we just tell them, do it. Yeah. Fantastic. Take the money. Enjoy. No, you, you don't agree, Pam? I just I like to have those discussions with the town. I think it's, it's great when they see that we're partnering with them and helping to. Um, I think we can let them know, certainly let Mary know. And even at our joint meeting, we can bring it up if the capital projects come. But to put it on the list jeopardizes other projects unnecessarily because we're not asking for funding from the town. We're going to self-fund it. It'd be like anything we buy, like when we buy a freezer or things for the food service, we don't put it on the list and then fund it. We just buy it. Kind of like Google through this committee dishwasher yeah. or something like that That's what in my eyes what, what seems a little bit different is that this is a facilities it's it's a part of a roof and we have a facilities manager we partner with dpw so i was just saying they're all in the already they're in the loop, the loop this needs to be done yeah. i don't know if if like saying we don't Nally know. is well, i think i believe she's she's most likely apprised of it absolutely yeah. I think she would be happy that we found other sources. I think she would be happy yeah. also. So we let him know, but don't put it on the list. The other thing is. Yes? No. When, 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 they, call, okay, good. when, they, <laughs> when do they approve capital generally? I'm trying it to. It gets with the operating. At the end. Yeah. Like at the end. And in order for them to get out there, to get this out to bid, to get the bid back in, it, to it get the product expert. that needs to get done that's probably hiding somewhere in some obscure part of the world, I, I think that that's another reason why we're not like doing it to be disrespectful. We're doing it to get it done. And because we have the money. And we have the money. This and you have then, just to be clear. Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. And we want it to get done this summer while the kids aren't in the school. Otherwise, they'd be doing it in the fall. Correct. We do. You, you would certainly expedite the uh the repair yeah. if you were to do it that way uh, just to be clear so everybody's aware that 
we have the money specifically for this project due to the fact that there is a facilities rental. Um, and so then, you know, and facilities rental has to go back to the building. So you can't use the, yeah. you know, each building principal, if they have a facilities rental revolving account, they can't use that money to go buy curriculum. They okay. can't use that money to hire a teacher. Okay. Um, the other piece to it is we're going to use that money and that facilities rental is going to drop considerably in terms yeah. of the revolving account and, you know, be down, down at least half. But in the past, how have we expended um, individual school Revolving, it might be around this kind of thing. You might be doing it around. I don't remember. I don't remember doing this ever. I don't. It'd but be, they must be there. Smaller repairs. Yeah. 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 Or Under the twenty thousand. Correct. So the fence and just, rails, maybe what things for the building would that, that would also help the building. So it doesn't come to us necessarily in that case. Correct. Right. Not necessarily. Okay. Um, if D, if DPW, you know, each building principal would love DPW to have X number of smaller repairs on their building. Yeah. Um, and whatever they can accomplish in vacations and summers, it, that so might be So who has they, the authority to expend those funds? You have the authority to expend them. It has to, but we've never done that before. So well, this, exactly. we've never yeah. done this to this level, a 30,000. Like a, yeah, large. Yeah. But the smaller ones, who decides that? You decide yeah. that really we do it with yeah, the principal. And the principal, yeah. yeah. It's the principal. Okay. And, and how much do we expend in an average year? Not, not every... Not every year we spend no, like they, they've exactly. had exactly they've okay. had fifty nine thousand in their facilities account for a while. Okay, yeah, and they'll build it. I was gonna say that. Like, I think he bought some um, uh, tables and things for like you know outdoor and in the oh yeah the, yeah because yep. then when people rent the building so it's it's for everybody and it's for also renters who you know might come in and it would help for them or um, folding chairs folding chairs things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can mention a capital, just say, you know, just didn't, we want you to know, but we felt that it didn't have to go through this process, just so we're being yeah. apparent and very aware. Yeah. The other thing I have a question, it has been $20,000 for as long as I've been here, since 2010. Right. The capital threshold. The capital the threshold. threshold. They um, might is there ever any talk of increasing that? Because we know it costs, is it the oh, town you know? choice? I, I think it is. The I thought it was. Oh, I thought it was a safe thing. Well, I, I will check on that. Okay. Time. I'm just curious because given that, this, given that they've changed some of procurement the procurement laws and they've increased those values, you would think right. they would maybe the old check it out. Well, I'll check it out for you. Um, I think this is now is not cool? not a bid, right? A three quote. Am I correct? Right on the board. Well, um, yeah, it's over twenty. It has to go out to bid. Yeah, it goes out to uh -huh. bid, but some companies are on the um, state contract, yeah. and that's that's I why he contract. yes. And then, but you still need three yeah, state yeah, contracts. Yeah. Well, or is that good practice? That's good practice. Okay. But state contract. You don't have to. Are they is the roofing company on the state, state contract? Yeah. Okay. Yep. However, but that's for Bruce to. Figure however, out. right. So we always partner with other okay. guys. Yeah. At least one. Which other. is good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. No, I think it's a home run. Yes. Because it was unknown expense. Right. It's timely. It needs to be fixed as quickly. Yeah. We have the funds available. Let's just make sure we remember, and when I say we, I mean when you guys write down that we should mention it at the Capitol. Oh, absolutely. Meeting, yeah. Just because so you're not going. To, I think the key is you have the funds available right now. Mm -hmm. It's going to cover this project. Right. If another project were to all of a sudden come up, person won't have those funds available. Right. right. So just so the people know, it's not yeah. like it's a it's a, a well that just keeps replenishing to that level. Now, if there's a problem with the deep freeze or any of the equipment in the kitchen that can come up. That's the kitchen revolving. Correct. Which is one of the reasons Which she they keep it. Does have her concerns. Yeah. And does insurance pay for any of this? Or it doesn't work like that. Uh, not that I understand it, but that's yeah. we can look okay, at. Okay, like a freezer kind of thing it's now. 23-year-old building. We, we have received some insurance uh, money in the past, but there is a uh, dollar threshold also. I'm trying to remember what it is. It's like... Well, 3,000, I, I can't 23 remember. 23-year-old buildings, but the roof's now out of warranty. Yeah, I bet. Okay. All right. Do we vote on this? Yeah. Yeah, it'd be good to vote on this. And the source. What are we going to do? And the source. Okay. I move to allow, should I, what do we want? I move to allow um, Bruce Feeney the ability to use the building um rental funds for Birchland Park in order to do the roof repairs and any reconstruction uh, from the water damage above the cafeteria. 
as discussed. Okay, I would just refer to the title instead of his name. Oh, I'm sorry. Just in general. Yep. Um, Scratch Bruce Freeney, put superintendent yep. of Department of Public Works. Thank you. Right. Okay. Right. That's it. Yeah. Motion made by Beth. Second. Second by Antonella. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries five to zero. Okay. Thank you. Anything else tonight? No, nothing. Nope. Good. With that, uh, excellent meeting, and I'd entertain a motion to adjourn, please. Bill move. Motion made by Antonella. Okay. Second by Amy. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries five to zero. We are adjourned. Thank you and good night. Thank you.